Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming on this beautiful, rainy day in Chibuktuk, Halifax. Chibuktuk is part of the unceded stolen land of Mi'kma'ki and also home to African Nova Scotians for the last 400 years. This land is now steeped in the structures of colonialism and slavery, the theft of land and people, and the racist system of policing and prisons being the manif contemporary manifestation of white supremacy, disproportionately incarcerating black and indigenous people. So I'm really happy to see many of you here and everybody watching at home um, to think together about how we dismantle these systems. So welcome to the book launch of Abolitionist Intimacies by L. Jones. My name is Fazila Jiwa. I work for Fernwood Publishing. Um, thank you so much to Kings um, for the space and for the books and for streaming. Um, and there's two exits up the stairs, which you can see. The bathrooms are either upstairs or downstairs, and there's snacks outside. Um, the first person who's going to start this off, thank you so much, Damini. I'm going to read her bio because it is amazing. Damini Awuiga is a 15-year-old grade high school student. She's a spoken word poet, writer, activist, fashion designer, singer, and art illustrator. Damini is the founder of the Afro-Indigenous Book Club, a book club she created to encourage young people to read books written by black and indigenous authors and to share the realities and experiences of black and indigenous Canadians. Damini was the junior artist in residence for Wellness Within, a community organization working for reproductive justice, prison abolition, and health equity. She was also a youth ambassador for Digitally Lit, a youth-led strategy that aims to empower young Atlantic Canadians. She's used Digitally Lit's social media to create a campaign for accessibility awareness in built spaces. Damini is the youth entrepreneur behind Damini Creatives, a mask and fashion enterprise that she launched in the middle of 2020 because of the pandemic. She made headlines in 2020 with her bright, colorful, and vibrant African fabric masks. She was CBC's artist in residence for the Michel Jean Foundation's Canadian Black Summit, held in July 2022, where she hosted an interactive community poetry booth. As a spoken word poet for the past four years, Damini loves to write and perform spoken word poems that bring attention to social justice issues she cares deeply about. Please give it up for Damini. Thank you so much. I bet you guys are all excited to read Elle's book, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so I will be reading my poem, um, Abolitionist Chronicles, um, inspired by Elle Jones's latest book, Abolitionist Intimacies. And thank you to Fernwood Publishing and my mentor and auntie, Elle Jones. So here it is. In the stretch of sky, 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 oh, we'll be there flying high, high, high. The spheres will ever be flying high, high, high. Look at these bars. Take a look. See through them. What do you see? Do you see outstretched hands? towards endless skies, hands that want to be rid of scars, hands that want to one day hold stars. As black and brown, we are disproportionately imprisoned, exploited and placed in solitude as punishment, forced to continue to wonder what autonomy could be. Emancipation and freedom spreading eternally. Each upturned hand reaching through bars of discrimination and trauma, beckoning to freedom in the shape of a dove, to land in open palms, to give freedom and connection and agency, to give freedom from mass imprisonment. With abolitionist goals, we will undo these built cages and eliminate surveillance. 
we shall rid our streets of street checks and incorrect assessments of our communities and people. We will break our chains and the binds of others. We will invest in our communities, treating the root of these issues as they grow, to strengthen our hearts again for peaceful, cleansing reigns to reign again, to be as we are, equal to others, no longer caged birds that cannot sing, but free, wandering ones, singing songs of healing and redemption. In the stretch of sky, 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 Oh, we'll be there flying high, high, high. As free as we'll ever be flying high, high, high. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to talk a bit about Elle, my favorite the auntie, and also um, one of my biggest mentors. Um, I talk to her a lot, late around seven, six, like anytime, whenever I ask to talk, she's always available in there for me. And she's like that too for the community, as you guys know. And she's a really great role model to me, and she inspires me to be better every single day. And also, she was one of the first people who got me started on this poetry journey, along with my mom, too. Um, she had, my mom had actually told me about this poem called Black Girl Fly, and um, I had been reluctant at first to do it, but she encouraged me, and then I started practicing, and when I got to the girls' conference organized by MSVU, um, I went up to Elle, and I was like, can I please share uh, this poem? And I was 10 at the time. So, <laughs> and she said yes, so I got to share the poem in front of everyone, and it was a really amazing experiment, experience, and when I got off the stage, I felt like I was floating, and like I couldn't feel my hands and my legs, but it was a really good start to um, a great relationship that I've now started with Elle and my relationship with poetry also, and I hope that your book will go far and um, be able to bless many people in many places. That was so, so lovely. <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce Elle now. And uh, we didn't talk about the, I didn't talk about <laughs> the structure of the night, but Elle has some special guests that she's going to introduce. And then we have Dr. Lynn Jones to uh, have a conversation with her about this book. So Elle Jones is a poet, journalist, professor, professor, and activist living in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She teaches at Mount St. Vincent University, where she was named the 15th Nancy's Chair in Women's Studies in 2017. She was Halifax's Poet Laureate from 2013 to 2015. She's the author of Live from the African Resistance, a collection of poems about resisting white colonialism. You have to add abolitionist intimacies into this bio. <laughs> Her work focuses on social justice issues such as feminism, prison, abolition, anti-racism, and decolonization. And since 2016, she's hosted a radio show called Black Power Hour on CKDU-FM, where listeners from prisons call in to rap and read their poetry, providing a voice to people who really get a wide audience. Give it up for Elle. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on this really horrible night. And if you're watching online, hello. I'm going to open with a poem, then I'm going to read a little bit of the prose in the book and close with a poem, and then I'm going to call up some really beloved people, and we're going to talk to them. I know a man who stabbed a man inside and got sent off to the shoe. But he says, when somebody comes after you, then what else do you do? I don't believe that he's a monster, but that's what the systems say. And now he's doing double life and might not see the light of day. And when you're 15 and your family teaches you to sell crack, 
Well, is there any coming back? So you grow to manhood in the max. And we define entire lives by a person's worst acts, so we just list the various crimes and believe we have the facts. So here's another story of another lost defendant. He's 20 years old, and he's eight years into his sentence. Brought over to the prison from juvenile detention, sometimes children in this country, they just don't deserve a mention until they commit a crime and then suddenly we pay attention. There are people in society we label as disposable. When you're already doing time, shouldn't be the first time you're diagnosable and so we put them in a prison where at least they are controllable. And I suppose it isn't notable. And no one gets emotional. Unless we find out that they're innocent, then maybe humanity's negotiable. But for the rest, you did the crime. So your humanity's ignored. And men are in so long they don't know how to use a door. And men are in so long they've never heard of Internet Explorer. That's what happens when you're black, when you're indigenous or poor, when you're considered to be criminal before you're even born. I get an incoherent... Sorry. <coughs> recovering from the flu. <coughs> Sorry. Live poetry, man. Before you're even born. I get an incoherent call at 3 o'clock in the morning. The same guy who called me crying to report he was assaulted, he says he's locked up in his room, surrounded by guns and knives. If they come to take him back, it's either his or their lives. He said ever since he left the prison, he's been numbing with a high, but people say to close his mouth because it doesn't happen to real guys. I suppose it's ironic. He's from the same reserve as Donald Marshall. So it seems to me that justice there was only ever partial. When we look back at that case and say, those 11 years were awful, but for everybody else, the same suffering is lawful. I've heard so many tragic stories, I could almost tick off a box, but still we call it justice once the prison doors are locked. We believe that punishment comes to the people who deserve it, but punishment mostly comes to the people who can't swerve it, can't avoid it, can't employ it, can't voice it, can't afford it, and then once you go to prison, whatever happens, can't report it. So we talk about wrongful, but what are the rightful convictions? Sure, there's Paul Bernardo, Clifford Olson, Robert Picton, but what about the man on his 50th charge of shoplifting when it's obvious to everyone the problem is addiction and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission can only be a fiction as long as indigenous people are still filling up the prisons? I have a hard time seeing justice as a reserve without a well, but then we bring its children a smudge kit in their cell. Don't we wonder what will happen when there's foster kids living in hotels or black children in the principal's office five minutes past the bell because they never learned to read and they fell between the gaps. We start with zero tolerance by the time they're done taking naps. Is it justice when some people start the race ahead by laps? in a country where we can't even guarantee clean water from the taps, and there's indigenous land under every prison on the map. And as you move up from minimum to medium to max, it's a funny thing in Canada how the skin just gets more black. And that lack of access to parole that is kind of like a tax, a couple of years of extra sentence that they tack on to our backs, and there's those weapons laws they pass that they claim are for the gangs, while there's white supremacists in prisons with KKK upon their hands, and there's guards who give them daps. And the police can gun down teenagers and never hit the stand. I won't even get into asking why we never charge the banks. But should anyone be sent to where they have to carry shanks? I watch police roll into Ferguson with snipers riding tanks. <coughs> I don't believe you have to not have done it for justice to be miscarried. When I've known men so long in prison that their babies now are married. Hell, I've known men so long in prison they first meet their son out on the range and I don't know that it is justice if we decide you can never change. And I don't know that it is justice when there's men inside a cage and I don't know that it is justice if the scales will never budge and men in prison with so much legal knowledge, they could be a judge. And maybe they could have gone in that direction if they only got a nudge. And it's true, I have known men who did a killing 
for a grudge. But does three seconds of your life make you only human sludge? And let's not talk about the corporations that profit off it all, like the predatory phone companies gouging prisoners for a call, woman going broke when her man's conviction's not her fault. I could talk about the scanners and how many hits are false, families turned away after driving up for hours because I don't know that it is justice and it's so easy to abuse powers. I could talk to you for days. It would all be the same ruin, and I know men who did their time down in prison with a soon, but they'll never be set free to share their voices in these rooms, and I know lawyers guards or judges who do their best to change the tune. But in a society that's broken, that's like reaching for the moon. And I confess, I once believed that every person could be saved. And it took a couple of years, and it's true that I got played, and I had to face that there's some people who seem to want to dig a grave. But I still don't believe that they deserve solitary just because they misbehaved. And I still believe we can do better and we have to find a way. And I'd still rather know I tried even if it means I failed because it never will be justice. Well, our solution still is jail. So from the people doing time in Kent down to people in Renews, from the people in the county up to people in the shoe, if that was your life story, what do you think you'd do? Thank you. <laughs> well, you don't realize that. I'm like, oh, my voice is fine. You don't realize it till you try to scream on a microphone. I'll tell you that much. OK, I'm going to read just some of the prose pieces in this book. Um, so this is from a section called Interludes. Um, which comes about in the middle of the book. I'm just going to read a couple of these sections. This one's called Bus Stop. Every so often when I'm waiting for the bus, a woman will come up to me smiling, and I look at her, and it's a woman I wrote with in the woman's prison, Nova Institution. We always hug, laughing and beaming at each other, the human contact and joy we were forbidden when we sat together at those glass tables, when even talking too much about your lives at all or any affection was cause for suspicion. One time I was waiting in the visiting area for the woman to come down, and I got up and looked through the books and games and magazines on the shelves of visiting families, and I found a sheet of paper. A mother had made a list with her children of what she would do when she got out. Order pizza, it said. Talk for as long as I want with no one listening. One of the entries said, walk, not in a circle. One of the women goes into a long meditation once on the phrase on the outs, about how it can mean you're angry with someone, but then it also means what you hope for. I'll see you on the outs. On a hot summer day, I'm running up and down Citadel Hill, focused inside myself. There's construction on the road around the hill, and a woman is there holding a sign. After a few repeats, when I get to the top, she comes over to me and asks me if I used to come to Nova. We chat for a minute at the top of the hill a metaphor come to life. She has climbed this far. She made it out. And then I'm just going to read this section here. It's called Equality. When I was allowed to go into the max unit to write with the woman, we would meet in a room used for school, programs, the library, and activities. One day I'm meeting with the woman one-on-one, -on -one and we don't have enough paper. We start writing on the whiteboard in the room instead. The woman I'm writing with tells me about how she was trafficked and held in a motel room for weeks, kept naked and drugged. She finally escaped. She described running through the lobby of the motel, barely knowing where she was. The cops gave her a few thousand dollars and put her on a plane back home. That was it. She told me she spent the money on drugs, and when she ran out, she robbed a pharmacy. She got five years, more than the men who kidnapped, raped, and abused her ever served. On the board in the room, she writes about running and about healing and hope. I tried to memorize the poem, to hold on to it before it was erased, but it's gone from me, like a shape moving indistinctly behind a heavy door. And then I'm going to read a couple more sections. Um, this is from, and Randy, I don't think Randy's ever actually heard this section, but you're in it, Randy, <laughs> so this is you. Um, so this is from... Uh, essay towards the end of the book, it's called Still Not Freedom, and in this section is about Randy 
getting out on bail. I'm not there when Randy gets out. There's so much delay. First, after his appeal at the Supreme Court, the Crown tries to remove his lawyer from the case. So that delays bail for a couple of months while they fight the removal. Then when we make it to the bail hearing, the Crown gives everyone a hard time, grilling us on the stand, calling his cousin's landlord to find out if she lives in public housing and if they're aware Randy is charged with murder. They claim she's violating the housing rules by offering for him to live with her. Randy feels like he'll be an imposition on his aunt, but it's obvious she wants him. Then there's the monitoring anklet, which has to be programmed from Colorado and transported from Toronto and costs $600 to install. And there's only one technician to install it, and that's three hours away from the jail. We hoped he'd be out for his birthday, but that comes and goes. We remake plans. Finally, a couple of weeks after the decision to release him on bail, the anklet arrives. It's late at night, and he can't leave without his sureties, so they drive to the jail two hours away to get him. On the way home, they stop at Burger King. Randy orders two bacon double cheeseburgers without the bacon. He's Muslim. Everybody laughs at this. Boy, you must have been in prison too long. When Randy calls me to tell me he's out, at first I don't recognize his voice. I've become so used to how it sounds filtered through the prison phone. Voices sound crisper, cleaner in freedom. But of course, this is still not freedom. I get to Randy's aunt's house in the historical black community of Cherry Brook right when they're leaving to go visit his mother's grave. We drive toward the church, but Randy's family lives all along the road on the way. We have to keep stopping, going into homes, greeting elderly aunts and cousins. It's a slow procession, like the stations of the cross or a pilgrimage. Each stop, another blessing. Reconnecting with the land, with the generations of his ancestors upon it reconstituting life, reforming, and remaking. Such an appropriate prelude to visiting the dead, to first honor the living. A reminder that we are still here, and we persist. Then the graveyard, anchor of history in the community. His mother's grave, never visited until now. A marker, not of death, but of generations in this place, from this place. Another blessing for people dislocated and dispersed, to be close to one's dead. I will never be buried beside my ancestors here in this far-flung country. Where my mother's bones go, I will follow. To walk upon this earth, in this community, and to draw near to the past, a ritual of completion. And after the graveyard, there's the kitchen, with family coming in and out, Men bring clothes disclaiming the act of shopping for another man, but they went to the mall anyway. Since Randy has been gone, pants have gotten tighter. We laugh at his skepticism, then there is pleasure at his appearance. Clean, fresh, new, remade. The kitchen, place of life and nourishment, filling us, filling us with joy. And in the middle of the back and forth and the laughter and the jokes and the noise all overflowing, his cousin pauses. We made it out, he says. And again, we made it out. And I think, isn't that the black condition summed up? And it feels poignant for a moment. But this is not the time for reflection. No, not now. Not surrounded by living, breathing, touching, speaking life. But of course there is later, when Randy tells me about how his ankle is rubbed raw by his anklet put on too tightly, and in the telling, connects the wounds on his ankle with the enslaved ankles rubbed raw by shackles. He asks, is this 1821 or 2021? The blistering is made worse by the heat and the sun. Freedom for Randy is spending his days outdoors, cutting the brush on the property, carving out the land, building space for his daughters to camp and roast marshmallows. But this still isn't freedom. Not with an anklet it isn't, and not with an October trial hanging over him, and not with eight years lost to prison, and not with the crown still making him a monster, and not with the racism we can never make it out from. No matter where we go, how far we run, no matter what escape we engineer for ourselves. And I'll read one more thing, and then I promise you I'll stop. Um, this is actually my favorite essay in the book. It's called We Gonna Be All Right. Um, and it's an essay where I was very down. I had got, not got another job. I was worried about work. I was extremely depressed. And it's an essay where I'm really trying to talk myself back. 
and find my way through this world doing the work that I'm doing. People talk about self-care, but what can that mean when the people who care most deeply for you and the ones you love in return are the people to whom you owe your labor? It isn't a burden to do this work. Not when the trust and solidarity and profound love you build by your commitment to each other are the reward. But still, when the calls from segregation come in the evenings, it means there's no going to movies or out to dinner or even watching a whole show on Netflix. And that's the work that won't get a tenured job. That's the work that puts pain in your body and takes years off your life. But when M calls me and tells me I sound down, and I tell him I don't know of a job next year, he's interested in the law school at Dalhousie. I knew Rocky, knew at the end of his life he was still having to scramble for cash. The institutions that spend tens of millions on buildings could have funded a chair for Rocky Jones if they had wanted to. If they had valued him, they could have done it. After all the years of fighting white supremacy until his heart literally gave out inside him, the institutions to which he gave so much could have made a place for him to live out his life in dignity. They chose not to. And the same universities that couldn't spend a few thousand to make sure Rocky was taken care of display his picture now that he is safely dead. Desmond says to me, we may not be religious, but what we do is like a religious act. We imagine and work toward a better world. But the heaven we are trying to make is here on earth. And while we are living here and struggling, we are in hell. But heaven and hell are the same place for us. So every day we wake up in hell and we have to do our best to enter heaven. We have to sacrifice for that. And we have to pay the price for that. We don't hold anything back in this work. Not savings, not our tongues that get us labeled troublemakers, not even our tears, although we push them back and get up the next morning and keep fighting on. Because someone has to buy the groceries, put the clothes in the prison boxes, pay the gas for visits. Somebody has to hold the hands in court and call the lawyer and visit the jail and take the call from the suicide cell. Sometimes I lie in bed and think about the books I should have written the papers I could have published, the poems and articles and chapters I didn't give my time to. And everyone tells me I wouldn't be lying here if I had just written those things. But then I ask myself, which life would I exchange for that book? Whose life was worth less than a chapter? And I know I wouldn't choose differently, just as nobody would choose differently. Not if you knew the life that was in front of you, that you had the power to sustain and hold. We are the living archive, I remind myself. And there is no tenured position, no degree, no qualification that can give me what is worth more than one life. It is not that I save them. It is that their trust and care sustains and nurtures me. That every day when I despair, when I don't know how I can pick up and rebuild again, when I don't know how I can fight these fights without sickening and dying from it, it is their voices that remind me over and over who I am and why I do this work. And these are my instructions to the people around me. If I die before you, make sure those who loved me and whom I loved are the people at my funeral. Scatter my ashes outside the prisons of this province so I can haunt them forever. Don't use my name for whack shit, and don't let the institutions that wouldn't love me in life take hold of me in death. If I die violently, remember that I hated prisons, and honor me. I'm not imagining my death. These are my expressions of my commitment to the living, to my life, and the life of others, to the sacrifice that isn't a sacrifice, but a sacrament, a blessing. Thank you. I'll stop there. If we have time at the end, I'll do a poem. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to call um, 
So in this book, it's absolutely filled with voices of people. Many couldn't be named for obvious reasons. They're sitting inside prisons. Um, but there are people whose names are in this book, and you heard some of them. So Sarah Tessier is one of the people that really helped shape this book, one of the women at NOVA that I'm speaking about when I'm talking about doing creative writing workshops. And of course, you actually heard a bit with Randy in it, um, Randy's community of Cherry Brook and his family and all the work he's been doing there. So I want you guys to come forward now. I think Randy might be outside, so we'll go get him. Thank you, Sarah. So first of all, um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm making Sarah do something. So I wanted Sarah to read this part that she's actually in, in the book. So go ahead. OK, you know what? It's too short. Let's switch. <laughs> this was not planned. You deserve a cat, Sarah texts me. I love her kittens so much, and she wants to get me a cat to love and be loved by. Sarah's been out about a year and a half. I met her in Nova Institution, where I got into trouble for hugging her after a writing group. Or perhaps it was because I asked her about her life. Or perhaps because I told her to contact me when she got out. All these things, all these acts of kindness and humanity are not permitted. Sarah gifts me my cat only months after she files a lawsuit against the guard who raped multiple women in prison. The prison couldn't keep her safe. The prison doesn't even try to keep women safe. She had to investigate her own rapist, gather the evidence, subject herself to his harassing calls so they would be able to catch him. Such a brazen act of violence out in the open, just another shift at work. Who would speak up? Who would listen? It is out of this horror that Sarah is bringing me life. She is not just gifting me a pet, she is remaking care. In a place where duty of care becomes assault, where touch is violation, where trust is exploitation, Sarah still believes love can be given in tangible ways. On the day the cat is ready to be taken home, Sarah comes with me to collect her, driving home with... <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> Driving home with the terrified cat struggling in my arms, I am conscious of this small, shaking, fragile life. This is what it feels like to have another being's life quite literally in your hands. Even now, I feel the ghost of her fur, her warm body, the terrifying sense of the power I have over her. Ooh, you're an animal kidnapper, says my partner, a diehard hater of pet them. <laughs> I have to say it that way, too. <laughs> He is being facetious, but still, is this what it feels like to be a guard, to know that her food, her warmth, her being are directly under my control? I think of the terror of homecoming for this cat, being taken from her mother and brought to a place with no familiar nurture, no comforting other fur, with all the wrong smells. How fervently, how helplessly we believe home is safety until it isn't. Until the punch, the nighttime trespass, the rejection, and after prison, how we believe homecoming is the end, how we forget prison still lingers in the running tap, the panic attack, the nightmare, how coming home is so often not what was promised, what was wished for, how often it sends people back. That night, the cat hides behind shoes, won't come out for food. She remembers that awful drive, but the next morning she eats, and in a couple of days she stops wandering the rooms looking for her mother, if only all dislocation were so easily absorbed and forgotten. Thank you. The lovely thing about that is that Sarah said that when she read it, she's like, I was trying to do something nice for you and give you a cat, and I see you have all this like trauma around your cat. No, it's not the responsibility of my work. Anyway, um, Sarah, I actually wanted to you talk a bit about the work you're doing. I, in this book, will talk about you, you know, I, I bring your story forward, but I just wanted you to have a chance to share your work with North Point and, yeah, just your story of where you came from. Absolutely. So, I mean, you're the first one inside the prison that I met and got to see exactly what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. 
And, you know, that's why I always tell you, like, you, you helped shape what I was and brought it out of me. And you changed my life. And then I got to meet other wonderful people. And I started working with, there are many of here today that, um, that helped me get to where I am. You know, I worked as a peer advocate inside the prison uh, because of my passion for justice and, and being a voice for those who are being traumatized and victimized inside and um, seeing all the horrific acts that, that take place and the people that don't know or have the capability to speak up or, or fight for themselves. So that's what I started doing and then I knew right then that I wanted to continue that work. So when I was released, I quickly left my plans of going back home to Northern Ontario, where I'm actually from, and decided to start new in an unfamiliar place, but surrounded by love, a place with people that supported me inside and people that I grew to love and, and trust, and I, they were my mentors, my friends, and, and I respect and, and give anything for them because I know that they'd do the same for me, and they do. So then I started working with um, Elizabeth Fry Society on the outside, and then the whole pandemic hit about two months after my release, and I got to, actually, I met Ashley Avery from Coverdale Courtwork Society. She interviewed me and uh, for, for a paper she was writing, a research paper she was writing, and she was phenomenal. And then the prisons had to be depopulated from the pandemic. So I joined the team of uh, Ashley Avery <coughs> and uh, Emma Halpburn, and so is John Howard, Elizabeth Fry, and Coverdale Courtwork Society. And I became a peer mentor for Coverdale after that. And I said, I'm never leaving Coverdale. That's where I will live and die. And technically, I haven't left you because just over, well, August 9th of 2021, I was pre hired on for this phenomenal privilege that I have now. Uh, working with the North Pine Foundation. I'm the impact manager of formerly incarcerated persons, and I have the amazing and, and privileged and honored job of going around our great nation of Canada and finding the Ashley Averys and the L. Joneses and the Emma Halpburns of the world and funding them to have, you know, to do the things that are, are most impactful for their formerly incarcerated persons. And that's huge because the North Point Foundation recognized that as one of the most marginalized and underinvested and underserved sectors. And let me take back underinvested because actually it's very, very invested in. There's tons, billions of money going towards formerly incarcerated people, just to the wrong places. <laughs> so. My job's to change that. My job is to fund the right places. My job is to make sure that people who exit the prison system can get all the supports, everything that they need through the people that I believe in, the people I partner with. And I also do a lot of other stuff on the side too because you know I believe that the nine financial supports that I offer come in many, many forms, and that's the beauty about North Pine Foundation, is we don't just cut a check and walk away like most uh, foundations or, or funders do. We actually provide the non-financial support, which is the most important piece, because our goal is to get you from point A to point B, and make sure that you become sustainable and scalable, and that we're not causing more harm. Because it's easy to write a check to an organization and say, help these people on this project, but when that project's over, you're causing more harm when those services stop. And we can't have that. We're all about kindness. Our core, core value at North Pine is kindness. And each member of our team it just lives and breathes kindness. And I'm very fortunate to be a part of that. And we also have other portfolios. We have 
newcomer refugee and asylum seekers. We have rural Newfoundland and Labrador. We have climate. We have special initiatives. And me, of course. So yeah, I'm very fortunate to do the work that I do. And I couldn't have done it without the people that have surrounded me and, and showed me and, and taught me and enabled me to be the best me I can be every single day. And through all my mistakes, they still care and they still help me through it. So here I am because of all of you and I thank you all so much. And especially you, Al, you have such a special place in my heart and you know that. That's why I bought you that damn kitten. <laughs> It's funny, too, because I said to Ashley, I said, I'm buying Al a kitten. You know, she does all these selfless acts, and she does so much for everybody else. And she needs something in return, just something to be given, to know that she is loved and appreciated. And I said, I'm going to get her this damn little kitten, because she loves mine so much. And, yeah. Mine are, too. That's why they're at the Coverdale office. <laughs> But I really appreciate being here. I appreciate everything that you do, Al. You're a force to be reckoned with. You are reshaping this world. And the world owes you so much gratitude. And especially people like me who would have never found their way without you. And I love you. I think I need to start making piñatas full of cash. <laughs> Cat piñatas full of cash. <laughs> then you get both. Uh, well, I would just like to, you know, speak to uh, the impact that you had on my life as well, you know. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this is your moment, right? And I'm sure we're all here today to, for that, right? Uh, for the folks here who I don't know, um, I first met Elle 2012 during uh, NSCC. I went back to, to NSCC Akeley campus to complete my grade 12. Um, and in that class, it was an all, all uh, African Nova Scotian program. So I took the program. Prior to that, I was, uh, I would have never done something like this with a microphone, that's for sure. But d through that class, I learned to speak out to, you know, just to be able to be in a room of folks and, and you know, speak. Uh, prior to that, I was very shy. So in that class with you, I learned just a lot about, you know, speak, just being more of, I guess, social of a person, in a way, if I could, if that makes sense. But, um, you know, it was, it was in that class with you that I feel like I really had an opening moment in my life. And for folks who don't know, I mean, I was incarcerated, uh, I think it was about 10, 15 days after graduation, you know, for something you know, that I, I had no knowledge of. I've been fighting that and still continue to do so. But I feel as, and I've said this to myself over the years, up until today, and still I do, I say, you know, your class with you, just you as an instructor, gave me some sort of strength 
to stay strong in what I was going through because along the, the way, as you know, as close as we've stayed together, you know, a lot of those things that I picked up on, those articles that we did together, those uh, getting, con getting um, what was it that we got signed, the petition that we got signed regarding the, phone, the phone costs phone and phone stuff, you know? All that stuff are things that I would have had in my mind, but I never, don't, I don't think so anyway, I would have had the, the courage to actually speak out, to fight, to advocate throughout that whole time, you know? And I, I just want to say thank you for that because still to this, like even now, like I'm known as a preacher amongst my friends based on just having that oomph to really make sure things are understood and explained in a proper way. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm very grateful for our relationship, our friendship, you know, throughout that, that long, long time I was away. It was a daily phone call with you. It was a daily, like a, a monthly letter, just a small little thing to say, hey, hope you're doing good, stay strong. You know, in doing time, I'm sure, uh, Sarah, this is my first time meeting you, but you know, a lot of people that you have, you're closest to, you know, you start to fall astray from, you start to lose that connection. And uh, one thing about Elle, she definitely didn't let those walls, you know, break our, our bond. And, and I, I just want to say thank you for that, because I know a lot of the times when I feel down and out, when I feel alone, when I feel like there's nowhere to go, it was you who would pop in on me, you know, for a visit. Hey, put me down, I'm gonna come through. Get a letter from you, it's like, you know what? You can't just get lost in, this, in these institutions and in these places. It takes good folks like yourself, you know, my aunt and uncle who are here to, this evening with me. You know, certain folks that, uh, that, that kind of, um, kept me strong, you know? And, and for the most part, it's like, a lot of us take the ones that are close to us for granted, but when you get into a tight situation, those are the same ones that, you know, you kind of get that guilty feeling. It's like, you know, I, I could have done a lot more in, you know, my upbringing and my growing up with my aunt and my uncle. I do a lot as I can now, but, you know, it's, it's uh, I just want to say what an inspiration you have been in my life, uh, how much, You've pushed me to do better in, in all the things just since I've been home that I've been accomplishing, that I've been getting involved with, you know, with the jobs that I've been offered through East Coast, who is here tonight, you know, great support group that have been helping me along the way. You know, Ami Sheree with the job that I've got through Dow. All of these things I feel are happening based on my relationship with you, your belief in me, your continued push to bring awareness to my case, you know? and. Uh, I just want to say thanks. You know, I'm happy I made it tonight. Because the whole time my view of you was always how unshaken you stayed. Um, and there's so many points in the book where I'm like so down about your case. And then I would talk, I'm talking about talking to you and you're keeping your head up. You're staying strong. You're moving forward. You're also leading. Um, you're not just sitting here, you're like planning renovations for like the house and the, the people visit in, and you're organizing petitions, and you're organizing a prison strike, and you're writing. Like there's so much that you're doing, um, even while you're undergoing this completely egregious wrongful conviction that's still going on in your life. Um, so the book doesn't finish a lot of these stories. A lot is unfinished in the book. Like it's just, it doesn't wrap things up, and your case is still ongoing, but. Um, Randy's case is a really, like a decade-long wrongful conviction case that is based on no evidence on witnesses that have admitted to lying, um, you know, files that are hidden in crowns, file, like, like it, it's an absolutely textbook and disgusting case of anti-black racism in Nova Scotia. Um, and it's not theoretical, like it's you, it's your life, and it's what you're going through, so, um, through the whole thing, I've just been so amazed at how you've kept moving forward and how you've kept your spirit up and how so many people who are inside prison look up to you and what you've done and the leadership that you continue to show and can show on the outside. Um, not just doing prison stuff, but like working on your property and the care you have for your family and the way you think about your community and how you reach out to elders and you're always thinking about. But, and that's what both of you really have in common, how much you both 
are always constantly, your first thought is other people. You're always like, who is this community and what can I put into it? And how can I share with it? So I'm so, I know I, like when you write these things, you take people's stories and lives and you try and put them down. And it's a kind of weird thing because it's not my life or my story, right? You know? um, so this book wouldn't be without you or without Sarah or without so many people. It's people's words and I really tried to do you all justice. But I'm so grateful for all that you have brought into my life, for both of you, how much you've taught me about strength, yeah. how much you've taught me about resilience, how much you've taught me about hope and laughter and joy and friendship and love and all of those things. And I just, I really, really, I just love you both so much. And I think thank you so much for all that you've brought to me. Thank you. There's so many details of this. It would take us all night to talk about this and the, case. You know, it'd be nice to bring some accountability for everything that's taken place, too. Uh, it seems as if at this moment, it's a, you know, not much I can, I just feel as if, you know, this case, without your continued support and, and the awareness that you've brought has kept me from being swept under the rug. I, I honestly feel like today wouldn't have happened without your, friend, your, your friendship, your support, you know? You bringing my story to the forefront of this city, you know? Because a lot of people prior to uh, this happening or me getting involved with, with you, uh, outside of, of that, I don't think like my jobs, folks that have given me opportunities who have been coming with support to help would have even known my name, you know? It's a sad thing that, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks who go through shitty situations, excuse my French, but um, you know, when you have someone there to support you and help you push through it, it gives you yourself, Sarah, I'm sure, just that extra oomph to get through those hard, hard times, you know? And so funny thing about the prison is put you in mind of the plantation, because it's something about, even when you don't know folks on a unit, just living in that same enclosure together. It's almost like a brotherhood, a sisterhood for you, I'm sure, that uh, keep people so tight together that it's almost like it's something you never experience out here. So uh, I know for myself, you know, daily you think about the folks that are still behind those walls, that are still dealing with the, you know, the injustice of the day-to-day -day life of prison, you know? So I'm grateful to have you uh, here to, to know that you continue this journey. I'm grateful for this book. Can't wait to read the finished copy. Uh, yeah, happy I made it this evening for you. And Grisha does all, I'm, if you know me, you know I'm not a paperwork person or organized person. And, and Grisha right there has, has like done so much. She's always trying to do more. She's like, can I do things for you? You know, and it's just so amazing. So thank you, Grisha. Yes, let's switch. Thank you, Ashley, Emma. There's so many people. Oh, I'm taking this mic. Okay. It sounded like it was working to me. <laughs> I'm just talking to myself. Everyone's like pretending they're listening. Um, but there's so many people in this room that do this work with Coverdale, with Elizabeth Fry, Patricia's here. Um, just so many people in this room give their lives into this. And I, if I start naming people, I'll forget people. But um, I love you all, and I thank you all so much for your work. So. There's so much love in this room. It's so beautiful. Dr. Jones, that one. <clears throat> Dr. Gladys Lynn Jones is an African-Canadian woman born and raised in Truro, Nova Scotia. Throughout her life, Lynn has been active in the pursuit of justice, working tirelessly 
for many causes and organizations that seek to eradicate racism, secure human rights, and achieve fair labor practices. She was the first black person to join the executive ranks of the Canadian Labor Congress and also served as a national vice president of the Canadian Employment and Immigration Union. In 1993, Lynn became the first Canadian-born African-Canadian woman to run in a federal election. Lynn is currently the chair of the Global African Congress, the Nova Scotia chapter, which seeks reparations for the transatlantic slave trade and other injustices, and whose organization published the groundbreaking book authored by children they engaged called R is for Reparations, which you can find on the Fernwood website. Um, Lynn is going to be talking to Elle about her book. Is there anything that you need? Oh, perfect. Thank you. And while we're sort of transitioning, I really want everybody to clap for Fazila, who did so much editing on this book. It was really 400 pages and actually kind of two separate books when Fazila had it. And it was really her work that brought it to the book that you see now. And so many people comment on the structure of this book. And I wasn't really responsible for it. So uh, Fazila just really um, had such a beautiful sensitivity for this book, such a generous feeling for it. And um, so the way you see the book now uh, is all Fazila. So thank you, Fazila, for that amazing work that you did, um, for understanding what this work was and for seeing it in ways that I didn't see it. And I'm really grateful for that. So thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. And I want to, first of all, thank all of you who arrived this evening for this really momentous occasion through, uh, I, I'd like to say, rain, snow, sleet, and hail <laughs> that you arrived here. And also to say hello to the millions of people that are out there in the other land who couldn't make it in person but are actually viewing, will be viewing us um, as we go through this evening. Um, I, I don't know about you, but right now, I, I was sitting over there and thinking, Lynn, you're, you're feeling something here this evening, and, and what is it? What are you going through? And I feel like I'm part of history. Like, you know, history in the making as it unfolds, and that probably it's never happened before. And I feel privileged and honored to be here to experience it. Is anybody else in the room feeling? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just amazing. And the reason that we're here is because of so many people of which we have to really give thanks. And I thank Sarah and I thank Randy for allowing us to be part of this circle. And I thank Demi, who, who the youth of the day, to be here to hear and witness what is taking place. And I always say that um, I thank him. Sometimes I call her my little sister, <laughs> too. I, I call, definitely call her family, because we have the same last name. Elle, who I constantly talk about feeling that she's never, ever been given her proper due in this place. And, and just let's give her a great big <laughs> round of applause um, to do that. And how, how many times have you been part of witnessing something? I, I, you're not at the right angle for me, and I can't get moved around. Can you move forward a little bit? Because I need to see you. So. There, sorry. Thank you. Um, how many times haven't things occurred 
around you and you've experienced and you say, this is not ordinary. This, not everybody can do this. Not everybody's doing this. They should write. You should write and do something about it so that others can experience it and feel it and learn from it. Elle's written it, thank God. So give her another round of applause because there's so many people, so, so many people that will um, ex uh, be able to experience and, and know about this for generations um, to come. In terms of the, the subject matter and, and, and looking at the whole idea of prisons and institutions and, and uh, defunding, I haven't heard that word yet this evening, um, I was thinking, um, what, what, what has Elle done with this book? What, why do people need to read this book? Like, what is occurring here? And I, I use my own life and think about, well, really, when you think about it, people that have been in this, these systems and incarcerated or prisons, and when we talk about it, it reminds me, I don't know if anybody had that, saw that, well, you're not old as I am, but the untouchables, you, you know that terminology, and it's like, taking these untouchables that society has said are untouchable and you don't want to touch, you don't want to feel, you don't want to be, be involved in or hear about it or be a part of it or hug, hug it or, or love it or anything like that. And to bring it into the forefront and say, it's touchable, it's beautiful, it's, the, it's, it's society, it's part of who we are and what, what we've made in this society, this, this horrible way that we operate. And those are the people that are, are, are the casualties of this whole system. So else taken it from way back here and brought it into the forefront and say, we need to do something about it. It's not, this book is telling us we got work to do. There's, there's activism that occurred. Randy talked earlier about, you know, it's just not enough. Oh, gee, you know, sometimes it bothers me when people say, oh, I just came to listen. I just came to learn. Like, you know, it's all about me. Like, you know, well, f forget that. Like, you know, yeah, you got to learn, but for what reason? Because there's work to be done and there's action. There's cases to be solved. Yes, that deserves a round of applause. So let's clap. We all have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility, not just even for this evening, to just walk away and say, okay, our job is done. The, the real work begins when you, when you leave this room and you figure out how you, who you're going to, to tell about this book. I know that it's, it, we're here to talk with Elle, but I have to tell you, regardless, in reading this book, is um, I, I had a hard time um, making it through the book. And I couldn't get my head around why, why was it difficult uh, for me. And I think I've got it figured out. Um, many years ago, uh, when I first came to the city in the 70s, um, we were doing prison work um, in uh, the prisons. I'm just a young person, I came here to go, go to university got involved with some people and we started uh, visiting prisons. And we had an organization that was called, that developed at that time, which was called Friends of Black Inmates Association. And we made regular visits um, to the prison. We, um, we had programs, I heard here it's a lot different than what we were able to do in those days. But what we didn't do um, at that time is that we didn't share all these um, stories that surrounded what was happening to those inmates that we were going in to visit. We didn't know all of these details that, and what was happening to families that Elle brought out, brings out in this book. You've got to read it to believe it. it she, we didn't know about what would happen um, with people who were at home trying to get in to visit their loved ones and not being able to visit. We didn't know all of that, and she's taken that, those first person voices and told us this is what it's really like. It's not just about 
coming in once a month or whatever, bringing books and saying, oh yeah, we're here, here to help you. So I hope in this little exchange that we have in a minute, that you'll get a glimpse of some of that uh, sharing and um, that you'll look at the book not from a superficial uh, level, but more of every sentence that she says, it's, there's something behind that sentence. There's something happening in society behind, behind that one sentence. So I, that's how I've tried to uh, shape some of the questions to give it to you. And I'm gonna start with a strange um, quite, not strange, but a question, because I know that, L, you, you were passionate, you were concerned um, from the time when you asked me if I would play this role, which I really feel privileged and humbled to be able to play here tonight. But I knew that it was really, something was bothering her. She doesn't know these questions but when they, that I'm going to ask. And what it was, was she was really concerned about what the book would be. Because she's, a, she's a, bi a big professor, you know, <laughs> you know, in the university, very academic, one of the best. And um, yeah, that's true, one of the best. But her heart was, she, she didn't, she was trying to get at, would she be able to present things not from her lens, not from her lens, but from the people that were affected directly lens, and that this book would not be the traditional academic book that people study in academia, but not at, for example, the grassroots. So my question, my first question centered, centered around, share some of that fear that you had about how people would perceive the book. Yeah, wow. Well, um, <laughs> so, I mean, this actually comes from my dissertation. And at the time, there was a whole kind of other book that had parts of this book in it that was called Canada is So Polite that was personal essays and poetry. And then when I went to Queens to finish my dissertation, um, you have to do an academic piece. So there was like this lit theoretical piece that accompanied it. And all that together was about 400 pages. Um, and obviously you can't publish <laughs> with people. Um, but by the time all of this kind of came out, I mean, it's coming out in 2022, there's writing in here that's like a decade old, especially some of the poems. And there's been so many books on abolition in the last two years. So I was really worried that, you know, with all these kind of books that come out, like Abolition 101 and What is Abolition? and that this kind of academic thing, that then my book would sort of be not only a latecomer into that, but then just be this other book that is like, okay, abolition is this, prisons is this, prison theory. And I just didn't want that. I didn't think it represented me, and I didn't think it represented um, what I had learned and what the work was. But it's a really sensitive thing to be living with other people's voices and to be speaking other people's voices. Um, you know, like it's not your story and it's not your experience and other people are taking the risk, like it's their names that are in this book. Um, I'm not the one that CSC, if they read this book, is going to backlash to. It's going to be the people who they think talk to me about it. And some people actually, like Jerry, whose name is in this, I kept saying, are you sure, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and Jerry wanted his name on it because he wanted his story out there and he wanted to be attached to it. But you know, I'm the one that gets the, yay, nice evening, like clap, clap, clap. And if somebody reads this and doesn't like what Jerry has to say, he's the one that gets the transfer out of the unit. So um, I was just very worried that it wouldn't, yeah, that it would either be a kind of cold remote book and be academic, or that, you know, I like that kind of ethics of sharing other people's voices. Um, obviously I asked for permission, but you know, you can't always, for every story in there, like you don't know where everybody is. Um, so I was very worried about that. And I just wanted the book to, to bring something that I had felt and lived on, really on the other end of a phone for so long, for so many years of calls coming to my phone and hearing these stories and how much it taught me and how much it shaped me. And I wanted it to be that kind of human book and like something that people could read and something that people could understand and not like you know a dissertation. And so yeah, I was, I was very worried that it would do justice not only to this movement, but to 
the, the way that people are together in this movement. I wanted it to really be about that. It's a book about love. Um, so throughout the book, what in the end, it's really just a book about care and um, how particularly women do care work, the work we do on the front lines, the work we do with each other, um, the conversations we have, the laughter, the joy we share, um, the resilience we have together and how we build that together. And that's what I've always felt, and that's what I wanted the book to bring. Well, thank you, Elle, because that's a good segue when you talk about the word shape, like what shape you, because you spend quite a bit of time in the beginning of the book talking about exactly that, what, who, who, like which people, what people or what events shaped who you are in doing this kind of social justice work in the area of prison. So I, I, uh, I found that interesting, the, the names, some of the names that you named and uh, who they were. But uh, you, know, you don't have to tell them everything about the book because they got to read the book and they got to buy the book. But can you talk a bit? Yeah, just continue on that vein about shaping the, how, how you were shaped into this. Yeah, so I mean, I always say that I read uh, Ballad of Reading Jail when I was 13, and it immediately made me into a prison abolitionist. Um, so that poem was just really powerful for me at that age. Um, Oscar Wilde, of course, is in prison for being gay, right? Um, and while he's in prison, he writes this epic poem, The Ballad of Reading Jail, which is, from the point of view, it's actually like, you know, it's like a soldier that killed a woman, but we can, you know. But like the, the thoughts on prison are, are really profound. So, you know, when he opens part five, he says, I know not whether laws be right or whether laws be wrong. All that we know that lie in jail is that the wall is strong and that each day lasts like a year, a year whose days are long. And that kind of stuff just really struck me at that age. And it um, really, and then I realized that that poem I did for you is, uh, that's a ballad, so it's in the exact same meter. I know a man who stabbed a man inside and got sent off to the shoe. He says, when somebody comes after you, then what else do you do? That is ballad meter, so I'd actually taken Oscar Wilde's ballad into my own work. Um, so there was that happening, and of course that's taking place in Trinidad because we're actually visiting my grandmother. Um, and so much of what I learned about well, on the uh, sort of two poles, my grandfather, who was a political poet himself, a Calypsonian, who was actually incarcerated for singing songs against the British Empire. Um, so he was actually known as the devil. You know, he was like a man around town. Um, really brilliant man, a chemist um, that was not able to get a PhD because obviously he was a black man um, at that time and became a fireworks maker. Um, and also was suspected of being a terrorist because he was also an early trade unionist <laughs> um, and an anti-colonial figure. So that's like the politics. But then my grandmother, on the other hand, was an extremely saintly woman, a, a, like literally like a church saint, you know, like left her door open and people would steal from her and she'd say they need it. Um, and I also grew up in this world where all the women in my family had lifted each other up, where my mother had been, you know, her sister's quite a bit older than her, and when there was no science for girls, it was my, her sister she went to live with in London. Um, I still have aunts, great aunts, that would be sending my mother $20 at Christmas till the end of their lives that they got from being domestics in New York. They, they were, like, sending back um, so that people had things to live. Um, my mother's sister was working, um, like, I don't know what she was doing, but she would send my mom money when she was in London and say, go buy yourself a coat, you know, go to a play, go see a show, go, go to dinner. And my mother wasn't spending it, she was saving it. And then when her sister said, oh, I wish I could go back to school and be a teacher, my mother said, here's all the money back. I saved it for you. Um, so all of this is how, these, this is where I was raised, where women were just doing this work. And like, Women in our family that, you know, yeah, working as nannies in New York and then packing Christmas boxes and sending them back into Trinidad. So I was always around that, but then also this political world from my grandfather. And I had always had those stories. So, so much of that, and particularly my mother's life, um, her dislocation from colonialism, her experiences of that, her, like, shaping of me, like, her push to me, like, everything she expected of me. Um, it just, so much of that came from her um, and from then like coming here and seeing women do things, you know, like obviously Rocky, you, um, going around with Denise Allen, Tinky, and like knocking on doors and telling people about Lincolnville, like very early on before people were really talking about environmental racism, where people in the African Nova Scotian community were fighting these battles and bringing me in and nurturing me and really teaching me how to do this work, um, you know, which is, is it's, 
all of this just kind of taught me how to live in community and how to kind of have some ethics around this and how to try and approach with integrity. So there's been so much. Um, and yeah, not to like be like in my book, but that's really what the book means to me is about that. Like it's so much a book about that care work that we do and how we, we try and live in this world and then how we try to, with other people, shape it in different ways. Yeah, yeah and, and, and as those people shaped you, you, you jump in, into this whole thing around abolition and you've mentioned it several times this evening. Now, that's where I had a really a difficulty getting my head around even within the, the title of the book, um, what, what does it mean, abolition, uh, intimacies, and what is abolition work? And I know you do address it in the book, but I, I, I think that requires even a further understanding of why, why did you name it this, and uh, why abolition? Well, Adil told me I should make a special title for Halifax and call it 902911, <laughs> in case people are like confused. Um, but it really means freedom and love, really, like abolitionist intimacies. But the kind of idea is that um, carceral intimacies are the ways that the state, primarily in prisons, but in all ways, and in, our, in all institutions, the way that the state abuses closeness, touch, and care. So, um, you know, the, the surveilled prison call the ways that they control touch and how you can't even touch each other at a visit. Um, strip searching, obviously, is a real example of abusing and really getting close to people's bodies. Um, like, obviously, you know, how our work goes into institutions, and that's such an intimate thing to, to give your life and your teaching and how often we're met. So all over the place, we live these carceralities, the healthcare system where we have doctors talking about, oh, I don't want drug addicts in my like, waiting room. They'll spit on people. So as opposed to that, those are carceral intimacies, the way that the state uses this really forced closeness in order to abuse us and do violence to us through paperwork, through uh, managing us, through of course, at the most point, incarcerating us. And then, as opposed to that, is what I'm calling abolitionist intimacies, which is just our love and care. Um, that we don't have the court, we don't have the system, we can't fight the guard, we don't have that, but we have the ability to pack a prison box for each other and take a call for each other and give each other hand sanitizer when we're going up to the visit. And, um, you know, all these ways that we push back when we refuse to, not, to break up with, uh, you know, somebody who's in prison who we love and who everyone's going to tell us that, you know, you can't love that person like they're a criminal when people refuse that, when people continue to parent with somebody that they love in prison, when people insist on being friends. So all of these things that are so stigmatized and, you know, God forbid you have like sexual desire for somebody in prison. God help you if you want to go on a personal visit, you know, then there's like something wrong with you. Um, but there's not something wrong with you. And those are our abolitionist intimacies. Like those are our ways, particularly through black feminist ways of care, that we push back on the system and that in all those modes we find a way to resist. So that's really what the book, it, it's like, so it sounds fancy like abolitionist intimacies, but it's really just about um, pushing back on the violence that's done to us all over the place through our own care for each other and our own collective practices. So how do you talk, um, Elle, about violence on the one hand, and then you talk about the um, inmates making you more compassionate? Like, how, how, does, how do those two things connect? Well, because, I mean, for, I mean you, you heard it sort of firsthand, um, you know, that people who are in these situations where you've been stripped of freedom by the state in an unjust way that you will probably never get justice for, which is Randy. Like, the, the, the Crown is never going to say, oh, I'm really sorry. Like, here's your eight years. Like, even if they said they're sorry, you can't give you eight years back. They could give you millions of dollars. They can't give you back your life. That will never happen. There's no vindication. There's no justice. You know, where, and I'm not telling tales out of school here. This is a public case, you know, where Sarah had to go to court with a guard who raped a woman in the prison. Um, and even as she's going through that, the last thing she says is in her victim impact statement, she, she wishes him well in care too. Uh, a man that was raping women in the prison, exploiting people, and um, like even in there, Sarah finds the way to say, like, I wish you healing as well. You know, that you are going into this space and I know what it's like and I, I want care for you as well. I don't want you to feel punished. I want you to be able to heal and account for yourself and fix what you did. 
Um, and, you know, Randy, like I said, I, there's times like where I'm like just in tears and then I talk to him and he is keeping his head up and he's keeping my head up. And there's so many places in this incredibly violent, obscene place that is a prison, but the people in it are not monsters. The people in it are not only statistics or the sum of crimes or even just, you know, objects to be acted upon and statistics to be talked about. Um, there's so much love and brilliance and like organizing and learning and teaching and all going on in that space. And that's, you know, what people gave to me and continually give to me. And that sounds weird because then you sound like you're doing this thing where like you get to be in prison and I get to learn. So, you know, like it's, it sounds, I don't mean it in that way. Like the things I learn by encounter, you know, I, I mean in a very real human way because there's no, but for the grace of God, as my mother would say, there go I. Like any one of us could be in that cell. And then we would want somebody to pick up the phone for us. And we would want somebody to do exactly that. And people are doing that for each other as well. So um, the state is a violent, disgusting organ that you know, commits anti-black, anti-indigenous, patriarchal violence every single day, anti-queer violence. You know, um, But the people who are victims of that have so much grace and so much like there's so much that is lived against that and i think that models for us how to organize and how to um how we learn how to fight back and how to live against that so yeah i mean it, it's not i don't want it to be phrased as like because that's the most neoliberal thing possible right <laughs> to, to like just extract your own well-being from other people's suffering and i i don't mean it that way i mean it um that you know this thing that we're told can only be um yeah, unseen, hidden, and kept from, that there's different things in there, and, and that's, yeah. Um, so having said that, I always think about, because um, you do address it in the book, is what are your hopes for change in that prison system, and how can people, like even people that are here tonight, because we talk about that, how can they support whatever it is that you're, you're hoping for, or wishing for, fighting for in terms of those changes, and not only you, but the people that are, are living the experience. Yeah, well, I mean, so I'm, it's not like an Abolition 101 book. There's a lot of good books on that. You can read like Abolition Feminism Now. Mariam Kaba has books out. So there are books that sort of take you through that. Obviously, we have like a defunding report that really is a policy document that takes you through what it would be to defund the police. This isn't that book. It's not a, like how do we do abolition in that sense. Um, but it is that book in terms of, um, it's a book about witnessing and recounting. It's a book about um, organizing. It's definitely a book about fighting back and um, how we can, through mutual care networks, how we can build something different. It is about that. And um, so that is really what abolition is. It's imagining and living in a world that's different from the world of punishment, a world that is different from the world of extraction, um, whether that be resources, whether that be the way we extract people from their communities, a world that um, doesn't spend billions of dollars as we do in this country on various punishments from our borders to our prisons, to our police systems, to our psychiatric systems. Um, and there is an alternative to that. And especially as the book ends, I'm really thinking about what it means to build that world differently and what it requires of us and the things that we have to give up to step into that world. But that aren't about giving up because they're about finding new ways to live together. So I think everything is abolition. Like what Randy is doing on the land in Cherrybrook is abolition. Um, clearing your ancestral land in your own community so that the generations that have lived there, that you're leaving something for them. So you're creating an alternative because black people can live on their own lands. That's what you're doing with your land trust. Like creating home and space for black people where black people can have homes and don't have to be in housing where then a crown is going to say, well, you can't have your son come live with you because they're on bail, you know? So we need to build spaces that we can go that they can't come into, that the cops don't live on the corner of, that they can't put cameras into. When we talk to our elders about sexual assault and when we have cooked dinner for each other and when we bring groceries together and when we make a community garden and when we give people cats and when we, you know, like all of this, that's the work of abolition is every step that we take of that it teaches us to live differently and to live with each other differently. So, so before, thank you, well, before we close um, this off, like what you just um, said is what I found um, uh, that was really 
great from my perspective in the book is that some of the other work that I do, um, for example, whether it be environmental racism, community land trust, um, archiving, you, all of these things are in the book. Like you mentioned it, the, like, you know, this is part, it's not divorced from what you're doing in terms of making changes um, in the prison. So I just challenge people here, whatever kind of, of work that you're doing or activism, it, as you read the book, you'll be able to use some of the prescriptions that she uses for change, right? And look at the work that you're doing and say, ah, okay, yeah, what I'm doing connects to what it is that she's talking about, which is really great. So um, I think at this time, yeah, I, thank you so, so much for sharing some pieces of, the, of what's inside the book. I know you'll, if you haven't read it as of yet, that um, you'll be quite amazed over. Uh, and what's I have there. to say that the acknowledgments are in the back, but you know, I, I call you the mother of this movement, and you've mothered me so much um, through this work. You've always taught me about how to go back to community. You always say that, like, well, what does a community think? Have you talked to people? You taught me how to do this. Um, so, you know, like, your name is, it's my mother and then you in the acknowledgments. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I mean, you know how I feel about you, how much you've taught, how much you teach all of us, and how much you must be honored by all of us in this work. So thank you. I learn at your feet. <laughs> and also, I know people probably have Desmond's book, but this is the paperback, and it's updated. So you should buy it as well because there's new information in that book that you should buy. And yeah, read Randy and Until We Are Free too. So. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for participating. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. Elle's going to be signing books. So um, get your copies. And thank you so much for everything you do. And even if I know you, just make sure you tell me how to spell your name, OK? <laughs> just in case. So don't be like, just sign it for me. Make sure you spell it out for me, just in case. I don't want to have errors.